Good morning, party people, and welcome to Tel Aviv, Israel. This is the second video in a row where you've seen me wear this shirt in Israel. But it's a different day, I promise you, than the last video. The last one I shot before the Tel Aviv Data Tel Aviv Summit. Uh, today's the day after the Data Tel Aviv Summit, and so now I get to go walk around uh, Tel Aviv. I'm going to meet with the folks from Madeira Data here in Tel Aviv for breakfast, uh, and then after that, I'm going to go walk around the old town Yaffa. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But it's kind of like Brooklyn for Tel Aviv. It has all these cool hipstery shops and restaurants, so it'll be a lot of fun. So first I'll do a round of your questions. Let's see, first up we have, Hi Brent from PEI in Canada. A support person told me today that when creating a table, an ID column should be almost a default for every table. Do you agree? Yes. And to learn more about why, check out my mastering server tune, I'm sorry, mastering index tuning class, where I have a whole module dedicated to how you choose clustering indexes for a table and how that affects performance. Next up, Naz asks, what's the quickest and uh, most effective way to move storage, move a database from storage uh, from old to new storage? For me, log shipping. I like log shipping because it's nearly zero impact on the addition in the existing primary server because you're probably already doing log backups anyway. Log shipping is really just about restoring those backups somewhere else. Then whenever it's time to cut over, you can do a backup of the uh, tail of the log on the primary server, restore the tail of the log on the secondary server, and you're off and running. Now people usually think of log shipping as a disaster recovery mechanism between two different servers. You can do them on the same server. So if you're using the same SQL server with both the old and new storage, you just set them up as different volumes, different drives letters, and you can log ship on the same server, which is uh, kind of nifty. Next up we have Simon Frazier says, have you come across scenarios where you feel like SQL Server would have benefited from allowing more than one 8K page for statistics? Yes. Yes. That's why I said that some of these are a speed round. Yes. Next up, Ingibjorg, which is one of my favorite names from uh, folks I knew in Iceland. There's a friend of mine named Ingibjorg. Ingibjorg. Not that that's an Icelandic name for everybody, but uh, says, do Postgres DBAs tend to have higher pay ceilings than SQL Server DBAs? I have no idea. There, we do do an annual salary survey. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash salary, uh, we do an annual salary survey, but I don't think that there's enough of a sampling rate for Postgres people to really make an effective decision. Next up, Ingi Bjorg also asks, what tools do you like to use when performance testing the network layer for a new SQL server? Copy a file. Get a big backup, copy it from one place to another, look at your bandwidth while it's happening. Pretty simple, right? That's why I said some of these are speed rounds. Next up, we have uh, SP Blitz says, my boss is a rocket scientist, asks, in which cases should we create statistics ourselves? I am sure that there are cases where people actually need to do it. I've just never seen one. Filtered statistics is a different story. If There are cases I've seen where people wanted to create filtered statistics for a specific reason. But regular statistics, SQL Server creates them automatically as soon as you run a query on one, any one column that needs a statistic and it's game over. What I would say is if someone, you said your boss uh, is a rocket scientist, have your boss go watch our free statistics class on YouTube. If your boss says, you know, you go to our YouTube channel and look for Breno's R Unlimited Statistics, and we've got a whole playlist full of stuff on statistics that take you from zero to hero. If your boss says, I don't have time to do that, that's your sign that they probably shouldn't be creating statistics. Uh, next up, we have does basically anything asks a question that I've answered for that person in the past. Does about anything, here's the thing, you got to actually watch the videos after you ask a question because I answer these questions. You said, how would you recommend tuning when faced with a cursor query that has so many iterations that you can't pull an actual execution plan because it overwhelms SSMS? Use SP Blitz Cache. SP Blitz Cache will show you sums of how many times queries ran. 
Uh, next up we have Ingibjorg again says, management uses KPIs to judge the developers. Management also wants KPIs to evaluate the production DBAs. What are good KPIs for this? I like the total number of high priority warnings on SP Blitz. Run SP Blitz and look at the number of warnings on each server from priority one through 50. And if those numbers are going down, if you're continuously reducing the number of high priority issues, then you're doing a good job. If those numbers are staying the same or they're going up, you're not doing a good job. Sounds kind of judgmental. And then the last one that we'll take, Mehmet asks, at what point should you ask the developers to introduce an app layer caching for a query that is rapidly re-executed? For me, it's a thousand times a second. If a query runs a thousand times a second, I'm like, okay, hold on, we need to talk. You shouldn't be running a query a thousand times a second without having some layer of caching on the front end. Now, maybe the results constantly do change, like customers checking their bank balances, but odds are usually when you see queries running a thousand times a second, it's fetching typical configuration values that don't change for extended periods of time. All right, so there we go. There's a speed round of questions there. I will go out and meet my friends uh, Guy Glancer and uh, folks from over at Madeira Data, and I will let y'all go uh, enjoy your day. Adios, y'all.